Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for uh, for coming along. Uh, Barry was due to give this talk pre-COVID, and it had to be cancelled. So it's uh, it's great to welcome him back. It's fascinating what you learn about people, you know. I first met Barry um, through Big Chief Little Wolf. <laughs> Does anyone remember Big Chief Little Wolf? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's a few oldies here. Um, he was a, he was a famous wrestler in Australia, and uh, originally from America. And uh, and Barry rang up one time and, and and just rang a bell as I was saying earlier that my brother used to wrestle me and he used to put Big Chief Little Wolf's famous holds on me as practice. <laughs> so that name was embedded firmly in my, in my memory. And so we met and we've retained a, uh, uh, an email ship uh, during, the, during the years. But Barry is a hoarder. His parents were hoarders. <laughs> and that's another thing we have in common, actually. Um, and I was astounded to learn that Barry has collected every letter that he's written and taking a copy of it. And I had to laugh outside there because Barry also, for a period of his life, collected junk mail. <laughs> now, this is a part of ephemera, and, and I laughed, and Barry certainly put me straight, saying, no, it's gone to the National Library because it's, it's part of uh, what happened at the time. You learn things from, the, from uh, junk mail, uh, I can't say I ever have, but um, <laughs> but, I, but I see the point because because it, yeah, the price of the time, the changes in colour, all that sort of thing, and and letter writing has been a great part of Barry's life. I'm not going to dip into that because that's Barry's yarn. We have heard this, not this talk, but a talk by Barry before, and I was absolutely fascinated. I can't believe the people. That, he's done all the things that a lot of us wanted to do correspond with famous people and, uh, and, and probably never ever did. Well, ba Barry is different. He did. This morning he was talking to Lish Fayer on, on ABC Radio early in the morning, just after half past six. And Barry mentioned his, uh, his, his political activities because Barry is a man of many talents. And, uh, and back in the days when he was at uni in, in Melbourne, he was uh, part of the protests against uh, things like the Vietnam War and so on, and and uh, and was arrested because uh, what was the, what was the uh, charge, Barry? Oh, it was contempt of court. Contempt of court because they, he was at university, and uh, and the, the order came out that they they weren't to trespass on on the university's land, and and Barry and uh, a few of his friends were uh, defied that order and uh, crossed over on and, and were arrested and were placed in a in a high security prison with with serious offenders Barry had no idea how long he was going to be there he ended up being there for six weeks and uh, and finally got out so uh, that's the sort of background that uh, this ex crim uh, uh, comes from, um, but we're not going to dwell on that because uh, actually I'd like to dwell on it. <laughs> um, but uh, I think you'll enjoy the letters that Barry and the and the people with whom he corresponded. So put your hands together and uh, welcome Barry. Welcome. Well, thank you all for coming and. Uh, uh, I'm always happy to have an opportunity to talk about my autographed photo collection. You can see on the screen that's uh, about a third of the collection that's in my home. Uh, I scan each original photo and frame it and put it on that display board at home. And I'm sure you've been looking and you can see my some are musicians like Eric Burton, uh, actors, comedians, uh, Manuel from Faulty Towers, uh, 
Big Chief Little is there as well. Uh, and these are all, or mainly personally autographed photos. Sometimes celebrities have a pre-printed photo with their autograph on it. I have a few of those as well, um, which I'll show you. Uh, uh, the collection is probably around 120, 130. Uh, tonight I'm showing a sample of 14 and also a few letters. And I'll talk, I don't know, a bit more than half an hour and hopefully if you have questions and you know, we'll have time for that as well. There's about 25 slides in all that I'm showing. It was a hobby really from about 1964 to 1969. Uh, and then I got back into it probably in the 1990s. I became a parent and I was encouraging my children to write letters. And my daughter was very keen to write to her celebrities and uh, she also has a smaller collection of uh, autograph photos. Uh, I think it began with me through my mother and through being of a migrant family. Uh, I have a Maltese father and a Londoner mother. She was born in Hackney in 1916. Both are no longer with us. But, but uh, being migrants, back in those days, like my dad worked in a factory, my mum worked in the dark room of a photographic studio. They weren't big earners. And the idea that you would phone your relatives in Malta or London was almost out of the question. <laughs> it was so expensive and difficult to do. You had to go through a special operator. So we wrote letters, a thing called an aerogram, which I'm sure some of you remember the old aerograms. My mum would write to her sister in London every fortnight and receive a letter a fortnight later. Uh, I've kept all of those letters from the 1980s period. Uh, uh, but it meant that I was in a family culture where letter writing was quite normal. And I really enjoyed it as a kid, getting the letter back. My mum uh, had, didn't have an easy life in London. Uh, her father died when she was very young and they lived in a working class railway workers community in a set of cottages in West Hampstead, which is now ultra expensive and trendy, but back then it was the opposite. During the Blitz, they were bombed out on three occasions, her mum and sister and her. And I think my mum escaped into the world of films. Her and her sister loved going to the movies and they bought the film magazines. And yes, my mum, uh, in the 1930s started writing fan letters <laughs> to her favourites. And uh, we'd been at home in Brunswick where we settled in Melbourne watching an old movie on TV and mum would say, oh, that's Myrna Loy. Yeah, I had an autographed photo from her. <laughs> or that's Clark Gable. Yeah, he wrote back to me. <laughs> the sad thing that I really regret to tell you is that when we migrated in 1954 to Melbourne, uh, my mum sort of panicked and threw everything out, oh. including those autographed photos. Uh, but I remember when I did write my first uh, fan letter, uh, I did ask my mum, how did you do it? What did you say? And uh, she kind of guided me. And that first one, which I'll show you in a couple of slides time, uh, the success and the thrill of getting a reply, uh, I was bitten by the bug and I thought, I won't just write to my aunties and uncles, I'm gonna write to celebrities. <laughs> I was 12 at the time, I should point out. Uh, but I thought tonight I'd begin with my most recent uh, reply uh, and that is oh. Rob Brighton. <laughs> that was a few years ago I wrote to him and uh, he replied a few months later 
And what I love about the reply, it's a terrific photo, but uh, he also included a letter, which I'll let you all read. And I think you'll really enjoy the final paragraph of that letter. <laughs> that, that's very uh, old English humour, I reckon, and uh, self-deprecating thing. But I was thrilled to get that. Uh, this is the first person I ever wrote to as a 12-year-old, and I remember addressing the envelope simply, Rod Serling. Uh, MGM Studios, Hollywood, California. <laughs> and somehow it got to him. This was 1964. Uh, my parents bought a television set in 1960 when I was turning 10 and uh, I was hooked on television uh, from then on. I loved it and the Twilight Zone, often it was hard for me to understand the twists in the tale or the me kind of moral messages that Rod Serling was trying to convey. But I discuss each episode with my dad, who also loved it. And while some young fellows uh, bond with their dads by kicking a footy or working on a car, um, I tended to bond with mine through <laughs> discussing the Twilight Zone and ideas in general. But I still, the hairs on the back of my neck still stand up when I think, when I remember writing the letter, forgetting that I'd written it and coming home from school and there was an orange coloured envelope sticking out of the letterbox and I said, what's that? And I looked at it and at the top it said Rod Serling, MGM, and I thought, my God, Rod Serling's replied, you know. And uh, it was a great thrill, and then I thought, who else can I write to? <laughs> yeah, that's the envelope. I keep all the envelopes, of course. <laughs> And that's the house, number 87 Shamrock Street. Uh, my parents uh, were, we often went to Channel 7 studios, which were in Johnson Street, Fitzroy, before they moved to South Melbourne. Or we'd go to Channel 9 for the wrestling on Saturday, Sunday mornings. We never had a car, so it was a big deal, you know. We'd dress up, we'd get trams and buses to get there, and it was all cheap you know, entertainment. Uh, and you can see, we dressed up on that occasion, and if I remember rightly, we were going to a television program compared by John Darcy. I just forget what it was called, but I remember we won a whole lot of prizes. Each one was, it's not like today where you win thousands of dollars worth of prizes. There was like a cigarette stand and a book and, a, and we thought, how do we get this back to Brunswick? Maybe South Melbourne or Fitzroy, wherever it was. And oh yeah, handkerchiefs he gave me and uh, they were the big prizes back then. Some of you will remember Bobby Lynn, Dawn Lake. I wrote to them after writing to Rod Serling. And uh, their names are actually a preprint, but to Barry, best wishes, they obviously signed. Mm. <laughs> uh, as a young kid, I loved uh, yeah. my favorite version, <laughs> Ray Walston. And again, the big thrill with that one I mean, so some of the photos are fantastic in their own right, they're just beautiful, I think. And uh, on the back of that photo, he sent me a personal note.
Goldie Horn, I think I was starting to develop into a young fellow. <laughs> Goldie Horn, yeah. <laughs> I'd like her autograph. <laughs> and again, that's a pre-print on the back of the photo. <laughs> I should point out, I suppose, that uh, I think for me, television and films were also an escape, like they were for my mother. And, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those people to get up with the bloody violin and uh, looking back on how life was difficult. But uh, my father was somebody badly affected by war, he served in the Second World War. And I'll use a euphemism of him having a quick temper mm. with my mother. Mm. And uh, I grew up in that environment, unfortunately. <laughs> the good news is that when I became a father, I resolved that my children would never have anything like that in their lives. Mm. They're both now in their late 20s and uh, I succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows who that is? Oh. <laughs> Mr. Magoo, someone said. <laughs> he did the voice of Magoo and he was the millionaire in Gilligan's Island. <laughs> now, I'm about to show one of the gems of my collection, I reckon. Is John Cleese. <laughs> Very best wishes from Pom John Cleese. <laughs> and and uh, some of you may recall an early TV sketch comedy series with John Cleese and Graham Chapman. Kimbrook Taylor and Marty Feldman. It was called At Last, the 1948 Show. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I loved that show again with my dad. We'd watch it and laugh and then reenact the sort of the <laughs> sketches you know, together. And um, so I wrote to John Cleese in 1968, I think, about that show. And I said, Oh, I love that, you know, you're so good. It was you know, I, I should explain that what my mother told me to do with these letters, she said, always begin by telling them a bit about yourself. And so I do that, tell them my age and where I lived and uh, my interests, and then let them know that you, you are fair dinkum, like you, you have followed them and refer to particular things that you liked a lot, you know, and, and I, I'm sure that with John Cleese I would have mentioned a legendary comedy sketch from at last the 1948 show, which is wrongly attributed to a later period, often. Uh, it's the Yorkshireman <laughs> sketch. <laughs> I'm so poor, you know, that, <laughs> that actually, and you can check this on YouTube, it's on YouTube, that was originally done as part of, at last, the 1948 <gasps> show. A brilliant sketch, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote to John Cleese to, because I liked at last the 1948 show. Oh yeah, and this is, uh, they're the people who were in that show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was the lovely Amy McDonald, as they called her. Make Amy a rich girl, a rich woman. What? There was something, there was a thing where she used to say, let, you know, contribute to the Make Amy a Rich Woman song. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I forgot that. Yeah. 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 Marty Feldman. Anyway, along with the, um, the, the autograph photo and that photo you see there that he sent me, there was a letter which is dictated to his secretary, I guess. It's in the first person. And uh, you can see, he thinks it's the first fan letter from Australia. Wow. So I have that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs>
and the amazing thing, if you read it, you'll see he's talking about a new venture that may or may not be successful, and that is Monty Python. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of historically significant in a way in terms of cultural history. Again, it's always such a thrill to get a reply. And uh, I once wrote to uh, Lena Horne, a great jazz singer, who was also a great civil rights activist. And um, I forgot that I'd written to her. And two years later, I received a beautiful photo of her just with her signature on it. So sometimes, you know, I can get a reply in a few weeks or a couple of years. Back then, things are very different now since the internet, which I can elaborate on later if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> the next one I'm going to show is my favourite actor. And uh, I actually purchased this image that you're about to see. Wow. Charles Bronson. He's so underrated. People forget that he became famous in Europe as an actor before he became famous in America. And um, he, uh, I, I, I bought this through the internet. And it just shows, I, I love the internet. I know there's a lot of crap out there, but the good things about it are just mind-bogglingly wonderful. There was a guy, a restaurateur in Newcastle upon Tyne in England who was selling his restaurant and over the decades celebrities had come in and he'd get them to sign photos, frame them and put them up on the walls. Anyway, he was selling these uh, framed autograph photos. Here I am in Canberra. <laughs> on my computer and uh, I think he wanted $65 for it and Bronson was I think was still alive at that stage uh, and it came with the frame and uh, uh, you know I, I paid the money and it was delivered within a few weeks and I thought man this is incredible what a world <laughs> I bought this from a guy closing a restaurant in Newcastle upon time <laughs> Uh, and that's Charles Bronson with his two best friends, uh, Smith and Wesson. One of her. One of the great comedians. And uh, when I wrote to Phyllis, we were on the first name terms, of course. <laughs> she, uh, uh, I mentioned that I had, I said, oh, I'm married, my wife's name is Joan, I live in Canberra, the national capital of Australia. I have two children, Joey and Hannah. And lo and behold, uh, after a month or two, a package arrives from Tortilla to Barry, love Tortilla, but she included three other ones, one for Joan, one for Joey, and one for Hannah. And they're different images, different photos of the Spiller. That's happened a few times. Um, it's very generous of them, you know. I, I'm a big fan of black American music, of blues music, and I wrote to John Mayle, you know, one of the great mentors Peter Green and mentored and um, Eric Clapton and you know just a massive figure in music and uh, I, again I mentioned I'm married to Joan she also loves your music and and he sent two autograph photos one he signed to Barry best in blues John Mayle and the other one he signed this one is for Joan, John Mayle. <laughs> 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 
Now, growing up in Brunswick, we were very on there for 30 years from the age of three. And it was very multicultural. We had a dozen different ethnicities in our street and a couple of factories too, you know. It was a very migrant, working class uh, environment back then. And all of us young people, I think, followed Aussie rules. We tended to barrack for Carlton, being that was the nearest VFL team to Brunswick but also liked the boxing and the wrestling. The wrestling promoters were pretty clever in that they, they knew that there was an ethnic market. And so they had people like Mario Milano, the Italian, mm -hmm. to rally behind Spiros of Rion, the Golden Greek, <laughs> even uh, Maltese one, Baron Sakina, and uh, Sheikh Wadi Ayub, the Lebanese. <laughs> And these were usually good guys who would fight the evil, you know, cheating rule breakers like <laughs> Killer Kowalski and his claw hole submission. And sometime around 1965, I, uh, when the wrestling was on TV on Channel 9, like I said, my parents and me would go to see it being filmed on Sunday mornings then rush home on the tram to see it on the TV at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Today they would never allow it to be screened at lunchtime. It was like, you know, it was pretty gory at times. But uh, around 1965, I wrote to Killa Kowalski, care of Channel 9, and they sent back a letter on letterhead saying, sorry, but the wrestlers have a heavy schedule and, you know, they travel interstate a lot. Mr. Kowalski can't uh, <laughs> oblige you with an autograph photo. But I kept that letter that was among my collection of correspondence. And then fast forward, I've become a dad, my son is Joey. And, um, and I've read somewhere that Kowalski had retired I think this was around 2000. And he had a, a wrestling school and gym in, um, in Boston. And again, with the internet, I was able to locate it. So I wrote to him. I photocopied the original letter <laughs> from 1965, <laughs> sent him that, told him what had happened, told him about my son. And fair thinking, I, I told Kowalski no. that when I was a young bloke, um, like I had to learn to box and that kind of thing. It was that kind of socio-cultural environment for young men back then. But I told Kowalski what I liked about him was that I'd read in TV Week that he was into Eastern philosophy. He was a vegetarian. I know it sounds bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and that he, he had a... He'd, he'd worked in the car industry in Detroit, but then undertaken a, uh, a degree in engineering. And that influenced me, because I wanted to be like him. And I thought, you can be a tough guy, in inverted commas, and be interested in philosophy and ideas, and be educated. Because a lot of us back then were in that Sort of part of Melbourne didn't think in terms of university much. Um, it wasn't a natural expectation by any means. So I told him all that, and lo and behold, he replies with <laughs> what you see there to Barry and Joey, your two great champions. <laughs> Best of luck. <laughs> Anyone know who that is or what she was in? <laughs> Married with children? Uh -huh. Katie Seagal? <laughs> you can see she's, uh, she wants me. <laughs> and I think, you know, that intersection of you know, when I think of Rob Searle and going to all the trouble of actually signing that photo and finding it and uh, the 
attracting as your light intersecting with theirs, even just for a few minutes. So there's some kind of thrill in that for me. Uh, so I should also explain that by this stage I was becoming opportunistic. And I was, it wasn't that I was a great fan, but I saw, like thinking of my children, I thought these are going to be worth money in decades to come. <laughs> and it's a collection that they will inherit. And by that stage, uh, who knows, they might be sitting on a small fortune <laughs> as collectors. series or Forbidden Planet, a classic sci-fi where he plays a serious role. Oh. Dave, did you do you remember? Oh yeah, and Tammy. Tammy what are you? Yeah. Uh, flying high, yeah. Oh flying oh, high, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> Surely we can find the, the surely we can land the plane. Don't call me surely. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I, I love the photo as a piece of photographic art. Oh. It's so well framed. It, it, it captures him as a comedian, as somebody with a joint of beef. From everything I've read about him, uh, I think he was like that. That's another thing I inherited from my mother. That she loved to read biographies of um, film stars, as she called them, and she had a few hundred such books. And when she died in 2003, I kind of catalogued them, and a lot of them ended up here in the library of the Film and Sound Archive. I donated them, and each one I put a little sticker that in memory of Olive York, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now this one we sent to my father. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> um, and it's a bit of a sad story, I suppose. You, some of you might recognise Dame Vera Lynn. Mm -hmm sweetheart of the armed forces during World War II and um, she had a few number one hits and I think like Dave, David could correct me but I think she was the first transatlantic number one hit. Yeah and, and had a, a, a top selling hit not so, not all that long before she died, not so long ago. Her, her greatest hit went into the British charts and became, uh, I think it went to number one. Wow. Yeah, yeah. All that. Although Alvita Zane is one that we'll meet again. Um, and anyway, and she lived to be 101, I think. Lived a great old, bright life. And she, the reason I wrote to her, like my dad, in 2009, my dad unfortunately uh, had cancer. He was on the way out, you know, didn't have. Uh, long left and uh, after World War II he had joined the Royal Air Force in Malta he was a assistant mechanic never flew a plane or anything he was on the ground served in the Middle East Africa Palestine France and then ended up in London where he met my mum after the war and he was in uniform until about 1953. He sort of enjoyed the Air Force, the military life. And um, anyway, their commanding officer told them on one occasion, would anybody volunteer to form an ad hoc backing group for Vera Lynn? <laughs> She's recording, I think it was Olivia saying, at Decker Studios in Broadhurst Gardens in London. And my dad lived nearby. And they said they just want like 15 or 16 soldiers and airmen 
and they want it to sound like they're in a pub <laughs> and they're just singing, you know, you don't have to be a great singer, but you'll be backing Dear Lynn. And um, my dad liked to sing anyway. He used to sing around the house. But this was about 1947, I think. And so they volunteered. A group of them went to Decker Studios. They backed, they were recorded singing behind Vera Lynn. My dad said they were only given like one pound and tea and dickies. <laughs> And the day his song went on to become a, a worldwide hit, you know, it would have earned millions. Uh, but another funny element to it was that uh, my dad reckons that on the first take, the soldiers and airmen were too good. And the producer said, oh, no, you don't sound like you're in a pub. You guys are really good. But they were in tune and perfect harmony. And so they had to do a second take. But I think they did three or four backings. And on, for any record collectors, and we have an eminent one here, um, will know that on, on, on those original singles, it says, with the backing of airmen and soldiers. And so whenever I hear the, those songs, they're kind of sad anyway, but I think somewhere there is my dad, <laughs> you know, a part of it. So when he was on his last legs in 2009, I thought maybe it will cheer him up mm. if I tell Vera Lynn, remind her of that story and ask her for an autograph photo. And uh, as you can see, my dad's name was Loretto, or Larry, Australianised, um, and she obliged. Unfortunately, it arrived about three weeks too late. Mm. But uh, I thought, what a good person she was mm. to do that. Mm. And uh, there's her letter. Oh no, it was before my dad, oh, your dad. Uh, uh, after he died it, it arrived. So but she lived on for another oh, ten years, I think. Mm -hmm. She only died a few years back. Yeah. She was a hundred and one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but and, and then I actually wrote back to her and explained, I thanked her for the letter and explained and she sent another letter of condolence. looking at the time here and uh, was, was doing okay. I, I thought I might, sometimes I'm asked, oh, what is the weirdest reply you've ever had? <laughs> the strangest? And I didn't include it, but uh, do you remember John Inman? Yeah. Are you being served? Are you being served? That's right. Very funny show. And uh, uh, I say it was weird because I wrote to him and uh, never got a reply. And then weeks later, I read in the papers, T had died. No. And I thought, oh, gee, that's sad, you know, that he passed away. But then, another couple of weeks later, I got an autograph photo <laughs> from him. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> and uh, there was a letter from the president of his fan club, and she said, as you know, John has passed on, but he never failed to reply to a fan letter. <laughs> and so they got him to sign a whole lot of photos when he was unwell. <laughs> and they were sending them out to any fan letters that he wasn't able to reply to. So I thought, geez, it's like I've got one from the dead. I'm so, I'm so good at writing these letters. <laughs> There were others who I missed out on. Occasionally, I like to write to political figures. And, uh, you know, I was involved in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, in solidarity in Melbourne, 1970, 71. And um, I was 
so happy, of course, when Nelson Mandela was released. <coughs> but I thought, you know, he, he, he's free. I mean, I'm not going to vote him right to him right away. <laughs> uh, so I left it for many years. And then I wrote, uh, sent him a letter requesting an autograph photo that I wanted to tell him an anecdote from my experience on the big demos that we used to have in Melbourne on this issue. And so I wrote the letter and said, you might find this a bit funny. This is typical of what's happening all around the world, as you know. You know, we had this big protest march against apartheid. The police uh, drove their mounted, the mounted troopers, uh, sort of, tried to control us or whatever, and we ended up against this big wall. I still don't know where it is. I'm trying to remember. But it was a big, big white painted wall, brick wall painted white, and it had ivy growing over the top. And I said to one of the comrades, gee, they're going to beat, beat the living daylights out of us. They've got us against the wall, and those horses were scary. And uh, my mate said, he said, oh, I'm going to jump over the wall. And I don't know why I didn't follow him. I just said, oh, it's pretty high. I don't know what's on the other side. Anyway, he jumped over the wall. And within a minute, he came flying back. <laughs> and he said, there's a whole line of coppers on the other side of the wall. They're armed with battens, and they hit me with a baton. Then one grabbed my arms, the other my legs, and they threw me back over the wall. And so I told, I mentioned that to Nelson Mandela. I thought he'd like to see that kind of rank and file grassroots protest anecdote. Um, but the reply came from his secretary, and the secretary said, look, he's very frail now. He can't do the autograph photos. But we read the letter to him and he wants you to know he really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I think uh, I've talked enough. And, uh, oh no, I haven't. There's still one. <laughs> this is the final one. Uh, everyone knows who they are. Uh, and with Ronnie Corbett, he included a letter You can hear his voice when you read that letter. <laughs> it's all kind of so well organised, isn't it? So tight and neat and the, just a wee note. <laughs> I can see him adjusting. He's got. <laughs> uh, I, I had a I had a cousin in Orpington, Kent, in England, and I told him. I wrote to him and said, "Oh, uh, emailed him and said I've got this autograph photo and letter from Ronnie Corbett." And he said, "Oh, we see Ronnie Corbett at the Orpington Post Office." And he said, "Whenever I'm there, and he is there." He's always haggling with the staff over the cost of the, uh, <laughs> of the postage. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, damn! <laughs> you were lucky to get the letter then, Barry, weren't you? <laughs> I thought, I wonder what he paid for the postage. <laughs> yeah, I had the envelope somewhere at home in my files. But uh, I'll leave it at that, and I'm hoping you might have uh, some questions or points to make. I put them in a folder and I put them in protective sheeting. So I have uh, mil those manila folder boxes, mm -hmm. storage boxes, a manila folder for each photo and letter. And like I said, plastic protective 
receive seating and I scan them and the scans are what I put on the wall at home because I want to keep the originals in good nick and uh, the envelopes too so I'll have a Ron Corbett manure folder file and it will have the letter, the photo and the envelope with the photo in the plastic those A4 protective sheets. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Bailey, look, this has been terrific. I wanted to ask you that all these people seem very kind, kind and to take a lot of trouble in you know, replying and, and kind of really taking notice of what you say. Do you think that's still the case? And was it? You know, do you think modern publicists do this? Well, uh, thank you. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that because it has changed a lot with the internet. Um, oh, yes. And I should point out that I reckon my success rate is maybe one in three. So if I've written 300 mm. letters, I've got 100 back. Mm. And... Uh, uh, so most of them don't reply. But what's happened with the rise of the internet oh. was that uh, there are opportunistic people who were selling them on eBay. And I've had two celebrities reply to me, this was many years ago, uh, and they'd send a just a little note, like a photocopied or a stenciled note saying, please refer to my website. Yeah. And it isn't signed or anything, it's just a note. And you can purchase an autographed photo. And I can understand it from the celebrity's point of view. Uh, and I have done that a couple of times, you know, I've gone to the website and purchased mm. the autographed photo. Um, but the other thing that happened with the internet, understandably, a community of collectors of these yeah. sort of photos, um, a community developed. One of them is called Star Archive. I, I was a member, you paid 30 bucks a year or something. And the good thing about it was, we, you know, it had hundreds of members and they'd talk about, somebody would say, oh, I wrote to Connie Francis this is the address, and I got a reply, she sent an autographed photo, it helps if you include an international money order, <laughs> which I did sometimes to cover their postage costs, so sometimes they'd return the IMO. But um, uh, the, the, the problem was that then all the like dozens of people who were part of Star Archive would flood Colin <laughs> Francis with letters and requests for an autographed photo. And it became a bit self-defeating. And I think the celebrities understandably got a, would have got sick of it, you know, and gone were the days when some 12-year-old kid in Brunswick was, you know, in his little kid's handwriting. <laughs> writing Rod Serling, MGM Studios, Hollywood, California. <laughs> I mean, that would have had a lot of charm and, it, it, and impact on Rod Serling. But now it's sort of more, yeah, commercialised, I guess. But I've still had success, like with uh, Rob Bryden. Mm. I think I got his address from the internet. Mm. Uh, I'm no longer a member of Star Archive, but... Uh, these days, if you just want their address, you type in their name and what is the address and you'll get their management or their agent, you know, their address. I, I, I'm hoping to get one back from, like I wrote to uh, the woman who played Sarah Lund in The Killing, you know, this Nordic noir genre in lockdown Joan and I have been watching heaps of Nordic Noir <laughs> and the killing just blew me away. It was uh, the acting and the scripting. And so I wrote to, I forget her name. Um, Dino. Yeah. Is that her name? Dino? Uh, I think so. Sophie? 
Dante Norden? Dante Norden. Anyway, I got to, I sound like I'm a stalker, doesn't it? I, I got the, her address, and her, that is her management's address on the internet, and wrote to her, told her that Joan and I were watching her, loved it, you know, during lockdown, mm. and kept us sane and happy and engaged. And uh, I'm hoping that one day I'll go to the post box and there'll be an autograph photo from her. <laughs> But yeah, it really has changed a lot now with that opportunism and um, people trying to make money out of the generosity of the celebrities. Mm. Have, you, have you tried practicing writing like a 12 year old Barry? <laughs> 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 I'm just sorry. Yeah. Um, did, uh, in the older uh, replies, did any of your replies turn into more than just the one letter? Did you ever get to write another one or receive another one? Uh, Always the, uh, the one. Well, I, I didn't really ever want that. Uh, as, as though they were waiting for me to send it. <laughs> you know, I know they weren't, but there was one case where I wanted to get the autograph photos of each of the members or stars of Are You Being Served? And I had a bit of success. <coughs> Um, and there was one, Nicholas Smith. What? He was the ball one. The ball guy with the ears. Yeah. And, and he, uh, I, I just wrote the usual letter, and I honestly did like that show a lot. And he, he wrote back a handwritten, like three or four pages wow. letter. And, uh, and he was sort of inviting me to correspond with him, I think, you know, because it was unusual to have such a letter that was full of news and reflections mm. and uh, but I wasn't that big a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it had been Katie Cigar. <laughs> it's interesting that John Cleese is very active on Twitter and uh, adds his humour still to his political comments. He's quite worthwhile following. Yeah, I've seen a couple of things on Facebook about free speech and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, I quite uh, like him still. Oh, I should point out that after, in 1969, I received that letter from John Cleese and the autograph photo. And then again, fast forward several years, I went to see the life of Brian that came out about seven years later, I think, 1976. And uh, uh, I was so impressed with the life of Brian, I photocopied the letter from 1969 and wrote to John Cleese again, mm -hmm. enclosing that letter. And I said, look, I wrote, you said I was your first Australian fan back in 69. I'm writing again because Life of Brian was just fantastic. I loved the satire in it and, you know, it's a film, that, a classic. And, um, and I think it was only a couple of weeks later that he replied and it was a handwritten letter. He was in America at the time, but he didn't send me an autographed photo. And I must say, I've tried that trick again <laughs> with John Cleese in more <laughs> recent times where I've photocopied the original 1969 and 1977 <laughs> letters and asked for an autographed photo, but uh, he, uh, he hasn't replied at all. I think he's probably too busy, too popular now. And uh, like I said, they don't want uh, people to sell their generosity mm. on eBay, you know, they, mm. uh, the websites that offer to sell, like um, the guy from uh, Doctor Who, uh, the one who had the long scarf, Tom Baker, uh, Tom Baker he, uh, his website, he was raising money for an animal welfare charity, and he and Matt Smith, who was one of the younger Doctor Who's, mm -hmm. the more recent Doctor Who. They had a beautiful photo together 
and I think it was $25 that would go to the animal welfare charity, but you could only buy it from Tom Baker's website. But it was a genuine hand sign, not a preprint. So I have that one at home uh, as well. I've got heaps, like Jerry Lewis sent me one, and Jose Feliciano, Dave Brubeck, he, he sent me two. One beautiful coloured photo of him at a grand piano, and another one a portrait shot. And again, my letter to him, it was genuine. I, I love his music. Uh, but he was an activist in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa and the civil rights movement in America. And I let him know that I admired that so much and how good that we won in the end, sort of. <laughs> we made a lot of progress. And uh, yeah, I, I just asked for a photo and he sent me two. And uh, I'm trying to think of other, of, uh, locally, occasionally I've written to local people. Uh, I've got Bert Newton, mm -hmm. the late Bert, in 1992. Um, Graham Kennedy. Uh, Moira McLean, who David might know, but you'd have to be a buff to remember Moira from Good Morning Australia with Bert Newton. She did the infotainment segment, and I wrote to her, and she sent me an autograph photo, a Polaroid of her holding a sign that she'd written on in text to pen, Hi Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, who would be your biggest disappointment then? I mean, apart from Nelson Mandela, is there someone who you really wanted to get a, uh, a photo or a letter from that, that never happened? Mm. There were some of the musicians I wrote to who I really liked. I think I might have written to B.B. King oh. at one point, but not really expecting him to reply. Um, again, you kind of, when you've been doing this for a long time, you start to think strategically. And I once wrote to Keith Richards, and I knew, I thought, Keith Richards isn't the kind of guy who's going to sit down <laughs> and do an autograph. <laughs> he's going to get heaps of requests, but he's going to be to whatever. To, uh, to get the act together to do it. But I thought, I know a bit about music bands, blues bands, and I thought the drummer and the bass player, they're the guys who are going to reply. And so I had Charlie Watts and the Rolling Stone, Stones, who wrote a beautiful note on the photo, and, um, and uh, the bass player from the Rolling Stones, the former bass player, Donald Blank, um, you know, he was, he was with them from the beginning. He did that song, Je suis a rock star. Uh, Bill, Bill Wyman. Bill, Bill, Bill Wyman. Bill Wyman, thank you. Yeah, and he put with love from Bill, you know, so we were old friends. <laughs> but of course, Nick Jagger, there'd be no point writing to him. Uh, uh, Ringo Starr, I, he replied with a personal autograph on his, again a drummer, you know. Uh, yeah, so it's a hobby that I never really thought would be this enduring, and I never dreamed that one day I'd be in this beautiful theatre talking to people and sharing it on a big screen like this, I can tell you. I, it's been great. Well, it certainly had been great, Barry, yeah, and we're so yeah. pleased that you were able to come along. <laughs> and I just wonder how many of us here wish we'd done what Barry did yeah, way back yeah, then, yeah. writing as a as a twelve year old and, and letting it become uh, you know, a lifelong uh, dream achieved. So uh, it was great to have you here, Barry, and uh, congratulations on a life's work. And also. Talking to Barry about the things that he's that he's spent his years in retirement just collating, the fact that his parents were 
well, hoarders are, conjures up all sorts of unpleasant um, pictures, but people who've, who've really collected a lot of things over the years and, and has passed it down to Barry, and Barry, by the sound of his passed it on mm. to his children. But they're important things. They don't seem important to us now, but, but uh, for future generations, they, they will be important. Mm. And, uh, and it needs someone like Barry to, to uh, put them all together. So once more, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed it, and hope you, uh, you, if you're not friends of uh, the friends, then uh, then by all means join up. But we intend to have future uh, evenings like this. So we.